Nietzsche observed in his own time that people were living their lives in absence to and not in response to the existence of God because liberalism doesn't give the necessary values uh, and the necessary existential framework by which a culture can continue to self-propagate. Islam is trying to fill the void created by liberalism. But I would say to anyone who's watching this, Islam did not work for the Muslims, what makes you think it can work for us? And if you're not willing to reclaim your own heritage, then stop complaining about Islamization. known as Bob the Builder from uh, Speaker's Corner. Not my real name. Not, not, not the real name. Not the real Bob the Builder. <laughs> and I guess I'm on Soko Films too now. You Holy are indeed on Soko Films. <laughs> I am definitely getting shanked. <laughs> I reject um, that. <laughs> so Bob, the inventor of the, the front bag apparently, yeah. the, 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 the front rucksack. Uh, I just wanted to really find out your goals, your um, your general ideas about uh, how Speaker's Corner has changed over the years. You've been you've been doing this quite a while now. A year now, just oh. over a year. Okay, just over a year. So your experience of in the last year, how things have changed, how the speakers have changed. Uh... Um, I wouldn't say that in the last year. I think the corner has changed that much. Actually, when I when I first arrived, there was a Islamist plot to um, stab Sarah Garvey. Uh, it was a murder plot, he received an Osman warning, and that's pretty much how, how I, uh, at the time that I arrived. And the tempo and the aggravation from there has just continued to bubble away uh, between the different parties. And at Speaker's Corner, you have, uh, you have Gang, which is one group, which is a black identity group. Um, you have Kemets, which are also a black identity group. You have uh, the Dawa team, um, and that's essentially a Sunni Dawa team, but there are also uh, Shia Muslims here as well. You then also get the odd sprinkling of other kinds of Islam, so Quranist Muslims, um, Ahmadiyya Muslims, and so on. Um, and then, and then there's there's the Christians, and you've got a, a sprinkling of Christians who are coming here as individuals, uh, and then you have two teams essentially. You have Soko Films and you have DCCI um, and, and that's and, and nothing really has changed um, in in the last year yeah you asked about goals yeah that's what I just like what do you hope to gain or, or, or pass on from this experience of, this, of, of, of your time so I, I, I started coming um, as part of a discernment for myself uh, I wanted to support Jay Smith um, and then I found out a week before he left that he was leaving and that was pretty much that, that first week that I met him was the week that I said oh I want to come and help you and he's like oh great I'm leaving and and he, he, he left the next week and that was my first week here and that's when I had that debate with Mansoor um, I don't know if I'm going to stay here forever uh, that's all part of the discernment. I may go on to other things, but as part of the process of the discern, part of the process of discernment, Christians have a a thing that we call walking the path, which helps you to discern if that is something that is your calling from God. Uh, and so, doing this for the last year and doing it with JC, um, and and the combination of of Bob and JC to create to make Soko Films what it is we would call in, in Christian circles a God incidence, you know, because it wasn't planned. There was no pre-planning. Me and JC just kind of came together. Um, I My arrival at the park as Jay Smith was leaving was not planned. Um, that just came together. So it's what we call a God incidence, um, which is also part of the process of discernment. My aim though... Sorry, may I just ask, could you explain for those who don't know what is a discernment? I will, yes, but I just want to finish sure. the answer to previous question. So my aim and the aim of Soko Films is to lift up Christ as a better alternative than nationalism or national identities. It's a better alternative than liberalism and it most certainly is a better alternative than Islam. The, the fact is the church needs to rediscover a muscular faith 
to deal with the, the cancerous, almost HIV effects of liberalism on our culture and the, and the, the, the distortion and vacuous identity known as, that's a nationalistic identity to which people often infer patriotism. As Christians, we have an identity rooted in Christ with a history that is rooted in church history. And that is not an, a, a, a gushy, wishy-washy, couldn't fight your way out of wet paper bag kind of Christianity that the BBC presents or that liberals want Christians to be. It is the kind of muscular faith that defeated the Roman Empire, defeated the Islamic Caliphates, that survived the barbarian invasions. And, and that's the the kind of message that I'm delivering for Christians to rediscover an identity in Christ that is an identity that can conquer as opposed to constantly being pushed around which is what it is at the moment because the Western Church is weak. So you asked me to clarify what a discernment is. A discernment is a, it can be both informal and formal. I'm doing a formal discernment which means that I have a spiritual director who is a, a nun um, and she is the lead master of vocations in her religious order um, and it is where through a constant process of meditation reflection and prayer a Christian is able to listen and to test what God's calling is on their life and so that's what I'm doing I'm, I'm discerning what God's calling is on my life Okay, okay, so it's a, it's a path of discovery, sort of self-realization, that sort of thing. Yeah, it is, it is a path of realizing what uh, God's image and being an image bearer of, of the divine image is in your life. So for me, because, you know, I have skills in oratory and, and the ability to, to form debate and discussion, that for me, you know, expresses itself in evangelism. Um, but different people have different skills and abilities and they need to find how they can use whatever skills and abilities they have to further the kingdom of God, to advance the cause of the church and to secure for the church its best future by ensuring that it claims territory in our own lifetime so that the next generation of Christians don't have to fight as hard. So JC is, is using his skills in editorial work and camera work. I'm using my oratory skills. Some Christians have skills in business to produce money that funds. Some Christians have skills in terms of, um, you know, management or logistics. Whatever skill you've got, artistic ability. artistic ability, whatever skill you've got, you bring it to the service of the kingdom and you bring it to the service of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, okay. That, well, I mean, that, that does sound like a lot of, even nationalism and patriotism kind of, doesn't that instigate or, or sort of suggest similar things you bring your skills to help your country to to, to be better and, and to do better completely um, nationalism and patriotism even Islam or any major world religion essentially calls for the same thing in that sense but as Christians we have to build our identity on what the Apostles and the prophets teach and there is no teaching in the Apostles and prophets that can lead a person to nationalism or to ethno nationalism you know, that these identities are contrary to the teachings of the apostles and prophets. As a Christian, your identity is in Christ, it is in the church, and it is rooted in church history. So when I became a Christian, I was born again. I was born into the kingdom of God. And my history stopped being connected to what happened to the British people or to the English people, and it becomes connected to what happens to the Christian church. So my history goes down through English history and then skews across the continent back to Palestine, you know? And, and that is now my history as a Christian. And I don't have a connection to Britain as a state. If, if Britain is willing to work for the church, then fine, I'm willing to work with Britain. But increasingly, uh, Western powers uh, such as France, Germany, Sweden, Scand Scandinavian countries, the UK, are buying into an ideology that is anti-Christ, that is anti-Christian, and is in opposition to the church. So if I have to choose between my loyalty to the state or my loyalty to my ethnicity, bearing in mind that there are more African Christians than there are English Christians, there are more Nigerian Christians than there are English Christians, Brazilian. more Brazilian Christians than English Christians, then my loyalty is to the church, which means that I will side with the Nigerian and the Brazilian Christians over the English. 
if the English are opposed to the church. My foci of loyalty and identity is rooted in my faith, not in an ethnicity, not in a class, not in a gender, not in a, a nation state. So we, we, the only time we can have any kind of patriotism to a state is when that state is also committed to the church as well. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of time, so I just wanted to finally, what do you uh, envision the future of Speaker's Corner and what you're doing here is going, you know, what, what do you envision that it will turn into? I think, will get? Yeah, sure. I think that the state authorities are becoming a bit tiresome of the trouble that is being caused here by certain Islamist groups and their sympathizers. Um, and I think that what will end up happening is that they will ramp up the exclusion orders um, and end up just ejecting increasing numbers of people from the park. But because sadly the state is governed by this nonsensical um, liberal ideology that has to ideology ideologically see the same problem in all groups, regardless of whether any evidence supports that belief or not, which it most certainly doesn't, to balance out the, the rightful exclusion orders of of these Islamist troublemakers, they'll exclude other people to show that they're not being biased, despite the fact that virtually no Christian, and in fact no Christian has ever started a fight in Speaker's Corner, you know? Um, How about the things like the cameras, uh, do you think they have exacerbated some of this yeah. uh, sort of attitude where people, they, I mean, I, in my opinion, I think that there was a time when people used to come to Speaker's Corner, yeah. have their conflicts, have their say, yeah. and they'd go away, yeah. and there would be this week of sort of gap between the next encounter. I've found that this does not happen anymore. What happens is there's this ramping up of, of hostility, yeah. then they take it online, and that hostility continues over the, the week. week. Well, over the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, Monday to Friday, and then they will come back to have a further, at yeah. a higher level, a, you know, face-to-face -face mm -hmm. confrontation. Yeah. So they literally do not, there is no dip. There is just a continuous ramping up so of my, hostility. My own, my own views of, of the cameras are this. Um, I, I disagree with your analysis, actually, because before the cameras were mainstay, and I think it's Callum um, Titans TV that kicked all that off with the cameras. But before the, the, the cameras became the mainstay at Speaker's Corner, there was violence still at the corner. But the only people that knew about it were people that used to come to the corner. And the rest of the world didn't get to see it. it was the, the dirty laundry was not aired before the world. All that the cameras have done is show how the police have been weak in terms of dealing with thuggish Islamist groups here at the corner, whereas before they were just ignoring those thuggish Islamist groups and letting them drive people out. And we've even caught that on camera now. You know, we've had the, the, the Jewish guy being chased out the corner, he's had it on camera, he's calling for the police, the police walk away. We've had police escort people out the corner on several occasions. The, the corner, that the cameras have made Speaker's Corner incredibly strategic in terms of evangelism. And the, the mainstay churches haven't cottoned on to that fact because the leadership of the church is totally incompetent. If any bishop in London had any brains at all, they would be training up evangelistic teams to come and work at Speaker's Corner with their camera crews, doing evangelism every Sunday and then working out in the rest of London the rest of the week. But sadly, the Christian community is led by these incompetent buffoons who could not see a strategical opportunity if it came up literally and slapped them in the face. And that is exactly what Speaker's Corner is. And, and the incompetence of the church leadership is startling. Do you think that the Muslims have actually taken advantage of this, this new technology? Because there's a lot of Dawah channels, if you like, available. I, I actually commend the, um, the Dawah teams for their imagination and their organization in how they are doing Dawah nationally. They are a proper missionary movement like the church should be. They're organized, they're well funded, they're well supported. They're, they're using creative techniques. They're using, uh, particularly here at the corner, they're using very intricate, intriguing arguments that beguile the untrained and the uninitiated. And, and the church has got to step up 
And I think Soko Films, and I say this without any shame in plugging it at all, but Soko Films has been a, a step up in, in pushing that back. Yeah, I, I, that's you know. what I was going to say. There is a, I find Soko Films to be the pushback against this ever-increasing um, Islamic narrative that is sold to us uh, through here, through media, where you know, oh, it's peaceful, oh, it's great. It's just, it's, it's just the greatest thing since sliced bread. Now, although I'm not a Christian, and I may not agree philosophically on the on the Christian narrative, I do feel that there was a necessity for a pushback of sorts. And I'll be honest, I don't think it's going to come from the secular atheist liberal sort of communities. I'll, I'll tell you exactly why it can't come from secular atheist liberals. Um, because liberalism can be split into two. You have classical liberals who emphasize the individual. So they will never ever be able to form themselves into any kind of organized resistance. And then you have liberal progressives who are totally sold to an ideology of relativism that means that they are incapable ideologically of resisting Islamization. Which means that the only chance that the West has, unless it wants to sell its soul back to Nazism and fascism, is a, or, or extreme forms of nationalism, the only chance that it has is to rediscover a muscular Christian faith. One that has a sense of its own identity, a sense of its own culture, a sense of its own history, a sense of its own beliefs, and is willing to stand up for those beliefs against all comers. And that is an identity that is older than any nation state in Western Europe, including this pathetic thing called the EU. Which means that when they accuse us of not being, you know, um, British enough or against European ideals, well, actually, we can point to a whole set of ideals and beliefs that are far older than European European ideals of that kind pushed by the EU and other internationalist movements like the UN. And, and, and there, there does have to be a pushback. You've got groups like DCCI who, who critique Islam precisely because the Dawah team have spent years here critiquing Christianity. And so they have rightfully stood up and started to form an intellectual critique of Islam. Liberal atheism cannot stand because liberal atheism does not have the historical root, nor does it have the epistemological or existential resources necessary to, to resist an ancient religious tradition like Islam. But Christianity can and Christianity has. Three times Muslims have tried to conquer Christian lands, three jihads in history, and they've all been defeated by the church. Not just the church in Europe, but the church in Ethiopia, the church in Armenia, the church in Georgia, the church in Russia. It is that worldview that has had the ability to push back against Islamization, against jihad. But what we see in in, in the country today is that the weak identity of liberalism is collapsing in the presence of a, a vibrant, uh, strong, uh, aggressive form of Islam known as Salafism. Because the liberals don't have an ideology that allows them to name a problem for what it is. They, they can't call a spade a spade. They don't, they don't really have the, like you said, the, the root they don't have the foundational because they're relativists. They're like, you know, let everyone live. Let, for me, I'll be honest, I don't care. I don't care if someone wants to be a Muslim. I don't care if someone wants to be a Christian. I don't care if someone's trans. I don't have any particular way about that. So I sort of like, yeah, let, let, let it be. Let, you know, you know what I mean? Let bygones be bygones. Let uh, everyone to have their lives. And I think that if you're faced with an ideology who is extremely clear about what it wants, how you should behave, what you should do, for the most people, people like order. They like their lives to be square and fit in a nice box. They don't really want this chaotic, do whatever you want. And so for those who are inclined to, towards order, they will go towards someone who tells them, I can give you this nice shaped box and you can fit your whole life into it and it will just be perfect. 
and liberalism doesn't do that. Liberalism can't do that because it fundamentally disagrees with giving you these boundaries. And these <laughs> liberalism was a social experiment that tore down the traditions that had built up over 2,000 years in terms of our Christian heritage. It is something that is formed in reaction to Christianity and that liberalism um, it was a mixed bag. I wouldn't say that everything that came out of that was necessarily wrong or, or bad because actually um, liberalism managed to brush off some of the cobwebs in Europe that actually did need to be brushed off. But at the same time, it threw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and the result of that liberal experiment is the, the kind of breakdown of social cohesion, social identity that we're seeing in the West and the demographic collapse that we're seeing across westernized societies, liberalized societies, because liberalism doesn't give the necessary values uh, and the necessary existential framework by which a culture can continue to self-propagate, whereas, whereas Christianity does and has done successfully to 2,000 years. In terms of giving ourselves order in our own life, the Christian faith teaches disciplines. It te teaches disciplines that form the inner man. We, we, you know, we, uh, anyone who's watched Soko films knows that we talk about the seven disciplines. And it, it allows us a prism by which we can understand our life and order our life within the modern framework with a value system that allows us to categorize things correctly and to see them in their proper proportion and then to act accordingly both as individuals and as communities. But you've got to understand the historical nature of the faith. It isn't that just a man sits down with a Bible and makes it up on his own. He's got to sit down with the scriptures and he reads it in light of how Christians have read it for 2,000 years. And that means that you then have things like family values. You stand up for the family. You stand up for the idea of your community, the church. You order your lives in a way that you don't just give in and surrender to every passion and desire like lust and greed and anger. It allows you to correctly focus your life to those things that give hope, to those things that give faith, to those things that cultivate love, to those things that defend the family and defend the community, that push back against immorality and help to cultivate a more dignified, civilized way of living. Liberalism simply tries to say, do whatever you want so long as you don't hurt anyone else. And that doesn't work because when you do whatever you want, you end up hurting other people. If I chuck a crisp packet on the floor, it hurts. It doesn't hurt anyone directly, but if 65 million people do that, we have a problem. And, and liberalism's, you know, it's, it's sexual ethics, it's family, uh, it's, it's, it's redefinition of the family. All of these things tear down the necessary structures and boundaries by which societies are ordered. Now, Islam is trying to fill the void created by liberalism. But I would say to anyone who's watching this, Islam did not work for the Muslims. What makes you think it can work for us? Muhammad set up a caliphate in the seventh century, a supposedly completed perfect system. That caliphate died. It doesn't exist anymore. The caliphates died almost straight away. Civil war erupted within the Muslim communities almost immediately because Islam didn't work. It does not work. But the, but the, the Christian faith, by contrast, has stood the test of time over 2,000 years because it is not underpinned by a belief that it has to control society. It's just helpful when it does. I thought, the thing is, I just feel that you can't really say that it didn't work when they were, you know, when they dominated North Africa, when they ruled uh, Southern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe for, for hundreds of years. Sorry? I know, I know, but what I mean is that, that you can't call whatever, that whatever you might think of what, uh, how they did it, they maintained a, a functional society for hundreds and hundreds of years within lands which were not historically Muslim and they conquered them and they superimposed their ideas and their language even over those people. Uh, so effectively, no, 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 I'm not saying it's a good idea, but what I mean is when you said that it failed, I find that hard to believe that it totally failed. Let me address that point. Um, where is Muhammad's Caliphate today? 
Well, yeah, of course. I mean, it, where, but, but where it lasted where, all the way up until the Turks. Where is any caliphate today? Sure. But where is the, where, caliphates, the caliphates? The caliphates that were established by Muhammad um, have all gone. The, the system that he established today is a distortion of what Muhammad established. Well, they want to bring it back. At the time, they, they, they want to bring it back, absolutely. And that is exactly what we must oppose. We must oppose this. The, 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 the historical process over the last 1400 years is that there's no ideology that has been so successful in resisting Islam as the church. But over 1400 years there has been a slow retreat of the church the christians buy into this idea of a pietistic internal faith that has no outward consequence this kind of idea of separating one's faith from one's politics this idea of not having a sense of working for the good of the church so that every generation of Christians has a stronger position than the one before it. Too many Christians buy into this gushy, wet, soppy, emotionally retarded kind of a wimpy Christianity. The hippie Jesus. The hippie kind of Christianity that is completely ineffective in resisting Islamization. You have to look back in time to see that when Islam crumbles is when Islam does is not able to control. Is not able to control. Those are the times when Islam has died in areas. If you look at Kazakhstan and all the, most of the stands, the, the the Russians first conquered those lands, and and Christianity started to grow in those lands conquered by the Russians. Now I'm not advocating violent conquest, what I'm pointing out is a historical reality that wherever Islam has been excluded from power, it has resulted in the fact that Muslims are more open to converting to religions not their own because they are able to do so. Whereas the liberal state in this country the liberal establishment, because of its ideology, is incapable of tackling a political form of Islam. And it, that will be its death. And, and liberals just don't have families. And that will be the death of the liberal English. So one of the reasons why I'm not too concerned about arguing against atheists is because the atheists will just breed themselves out of existence. As societies become more atheistic and follow atheistic values, they stop having families, they stop having children, and they will pass out of history. So I'm not worried about atheism, you know? So, so I, I think that the English, and I'm, I'm speaking directly to my own people now, my own people in the sense of those that would identify with me because of my ethnicity, I say to you that you need to rediscover the Christian faith. You need to rediscover a muscular Christianity. Not the pansy version that you see the Archbishop of Canterbury practicing, but the historical faith that is able to stand up for itself. And if you're not willing to reclaim your own heritage, then stop complaining about Islamization. Because if you aren't willing to stand up for something better, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Bob. It's been a pleasure. No worries. Have a nice day. Does anyone else have any other questions? I don't think, I don't think atheists will bring themselves out of existence. I mean, atheists will remain horny enough to have families. Do you think that we see, if you look at, if you look at families in our, in our liberal society, we have a massive problem of divorce, a massive problem of children being born outside of the family, a, fam a united family we have a huge numbers of abortion all of these sort of uh, cultural traits are developments of a liberal atheistic worldview in which there is a common belief that there is no life inside the womb that the family is just what we make it and that any family structure is as good as the next but history contradicts all of that and so atheists, um, if you look at Germany, for example, Germany is a society that on paper is Christian, but 
by state practice and by culture is atheistic. It is a culture that is dying demographically. That's also true for Italy. It's also true for France and all the secular liberal states. Even Japan. Even Japan, <laughs> another country that is predominantly atheist. So yes, over time, atheists will simply become an irrelevance. They are a blip on history. They are not, uh, they're not going to be a bigger threat. Particularly as Christians rediscover a reconciliation between scientific discovery and the Christian faith, which is the only real beating stick that atheists are able to use. And the moment we stop fighting science, good science, not bad science, but the moment we stop fighting good science, the atheists will have no stick to use against the Christian community at all. Any other questions? Are we all done? Because I want to talk about something else now if no one else has any questions. Well, I was going to say about you know, the Enlightenment in Europe, yeah? Yeah. You know, they said they come out of the Dark Ages, like. So, who brought the darkness, yeah? Well, let's just, let's just deal with that. So, the Dark Ages is, is, is a term that is so misunderstood and so used, and so misused. The Dark Ages is a Christian term coined by the Church. It was the church that coined the term Dark Ages and it was to refer to that period of time when Greco-Roman civilization collapsed in the West in the 4th century and continued until the early medieval period of about the, uh, the mid 8th and the mid 9th, sorry the mid 8th to mid 9th century when we moved into what was known as the medieval period and the church in that period spoke about the period from the 4th century until the Carolingian um, Renaissance as the Dark Ages because all of our, our sense of antiquity was lost because of barbarian, uh, pagan and Aryan invasions. The Enlightenment comes along and you misappropriates that term and misapplies it to the whole of Christian history to, to talk about the Enlightenment. But even the term enlightenment is a Christian term. It was used pejoratively by Christians to critique those people who were coming up with these newfangled ideas in the 1700s and the 1800s, mockingly, mockingly calling them the enlightened because they were dismissing all of received history and learning to create new forms of learning. Now, wisdom is known by its children and out of the Enlightenment we have both had both healthy babies and deformed mutant babies. The Enlightenment is a mixed bag. There are many good things that have come out of the Enlightenment. Many Christians were involved in the birth of the Enlightenment. I think of René Descartes as one of the prime examples a philosopher who was a Jesuit educated philosopher who coined the term cogito ergo sum which is the epistemological basis upon which enlightenment philosophy then began to flourish but this then mutates over the course of 300 years to things like Nietzsche who then writes things like the Antichrist in terms of which he calls for the rising of the Ubermensch in response to what he decried as the death of God. Now, just for those of you that might not know these terms, I'll, I'll elaborate on them very briefly. The death of God thesis made by Nietzsche was a, a philosophical response to a sociological phenomena that Nietzsche observed in his own time that people were living their lives in absence to and not in response to the existence of God. And he said that man was walking over a void and at any point the danger would be that man and humanity would fall into that void and fall into lives of irrelevance. And he called this life of irrelevance the last man. A man, a kind of man, who entertains himself with trinkets and seeks no great achievement seeks nothing but to play on computer games and to build model tanks and to entertain himself with pointless YouTube videos and to make selfies of himself and to 
post v pictures of his food on uh, um, Facebook to show all of his friends and to write utter nonsense on Twitter. That's the kind of man Nietzsche was talking about. And he said that without God, who inspires man to achieve beyond himself, that what was needed was an Ubermensch, a superman, the kind of man who would exalt himself through his own will and determination to push himself to some great achievement, whether that be in architecture or art or, or anything. It was an atheistic sense of hope that he was trying to create. And that kind of reasoning sent him mad because he realized how pointless it was, how internally contradictory it was to create a system of values that have no basis in objective reality. However, the Christian faith is based in objective reality and calls human beings to live lives of hope, to live lives of faith, to live lives of love, and those three cardinal spiritual virtues are the inspiration by which man can build the existential framework by which he can excel in every field. The early natural philosophers who were the predicates of our modern science in Western Europe, to which the whole world is now blessed, is a fruit of Christian spirituality because those natural philosophers were inspired by the belief that a creator God had a rational mind and had created the universe with rational order and that through rationalistic inquiry, man could explore the mind of God through investigating the natural world around him. This was a spiritual movement. These were people who were seeking to draw closer to God and seeking to perfect what they were doing through their spirituality. Without that spiritual underpinning, our society into the West has simply descended into triviality, into relativism, into a form of life that is not worthy of the, the title great civilization. And that is exactly why it is dying. Because atheism, relativism, gives no life. For life to excel out of the spirit of man, man must be inspired by those objective truths that surround him in reality, that lead him towards his God, that allow him to order his life appropriately. Any other questions? Syphilis draws an itch in uh, I think syphilis didn't help him. One has to wonder why someone might have caught syphilis and whether that could have been connected to a lack of Christian moral ethics on sexuality. Well, just like lots of Christians sort of uh, have their little piece of tart on, on the side. There is absolutely the case that Christians struggle with sexuality just like every other human being does. Any other questions? You want to ask for a recycler, no, that's okay. Any other questions or shall I move on to my next topic? Okay.